Cluster B personality disorders are characterized by dramatic, overly emotional, and unpredictable thoughts and behavior. From Ars Longa Media, this is Cluster B, scientifically informed, expert insights into the four Cluster B personality types, antisocial, borderline, narcissistic, and histrionic personality disorder. Here's today's host, Dr. Todd Grande. Well, this is Dr. Grande. Today, I have a few different questions for this video, and they're all surrounding this idea, this construct of malingering. So the first would be, can somebody fake a mental illness? Next would be, which ones are often faked? So which mental disorders we see where people are trying to malinger? And what about psychosis and malingering? So I'll answer all these questions about malingering. And it's important to know here that some mental disorders can really be easily faked. And I'll talk about those. But it's not always so simple as to say it's malingering. So the first thing I want to do is draw the distinction between malingering, factitious disorder, and somatic symptom disorder. So about these disorders, it's important to know that they're all relatively rare. And of course, here we're talking about these disorders in relation to mental health issues. So faking a mental disorder or mental health symptoms. So to start with, I'll cover malingering. So malingering is not a mental disorder. It's a V code. So it's really a condition and it can be the focus of clinical attention. But again, it's not something that somebody can be diagnosed like a mental disorder. Malingering is when somebody fakes mental health symptoms. Again, it can be physical health, but that's a separate area here. I'm just talking about mental health. So it's when somebody fakes mental health symptoms for external gain. So malingering is deliberate. Now, factitious disorder is actually somewhat similar, except it is a mental disorder, but the faking of mental health symptoms is done for sympathy, not for money or any other material gain. Factitious disorder, like malingering, is also deliberate. So if somebody knows that they don't have the mental health symptoms and they're telling you that they do or they're acting like they do. Now, somatic symptom disorder is really quite different from those other two. Somatic symptom disorder is when somebody has real symptoms that are not explained. So there's no other explanation for the symptoms. They're real, but they seem to have something to do with the mental health side as opposed to having a physical cause. So some important distinctions there between malingering factitious disorder and somatic symptom disorder. Now, this video, of course, is focusing on malingering. So mental disorders can be easily faked, as I mentioned before. Some are more easily faked than others. And I think one of the reasons they can be easily faked is all the information about mental disorders is available in the literature. The DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, outlines all the symptoms necessary for specific diagnoses. So again, the information is really accessible. Anybody can buy a DSM, anybody can look up the literature and read about all these different symptoms that would be necessary for diagnosis. Now, there are three different types of malingering. We see pure malingering. This is when somebody is acting like they have a disorder that they don't have. So they have no mental health symptoms in reality, but they're acting like they have a disorder that's characterized by mental health symptoms. We also have partial malingering. This is when somebody does have real symptoms and they're exaggerating those symptoms. This one's particularly hard to detect. When somebody has even subclinical symptoms that are real and say they're just acting like they're rising to the clinical level, it's very hard to catch that. The last type of malingering is called false imputation. This is when somebody has real symptoms, but they say the cause of the symptoms is different than it really is. And again, this is very hard to catch. So an example of this would be somebody actually has post-traumatic stress disorder from a car accident, so they have real symptoms, but then they say that the post-traumatic stress disorder, the symptoms are actually caused by a relationship. So the partial malingering and the false imputation, again, very hard to detect. Pure malingering, that first type, is a little easier to detect, but really all different types of malingering are challenging to spot. So when we talk about malingering, why would somebody fake the symptoms of a mental disorder? What would be the purpose of this? Well, there are really two different areas we could think about here. One is to gain something and the other is to avoid something. So on the gain side, we'd see motives like substances, 
like being prescribed medications from a psychiatrist, for example. We see gaining money, housing. On the avoid side, we see trying to avoid arrest, although usually this doesn't work. We also see avoiding prison, and sometimes malingering can help somebody to avoid prison. More often, though, we see it as gaining better conditions in a prison, so being moved from one unit over to a mental health unit. Again, people who malinger aren't always successful at this, but this is one of the reasons. Another reason could be to avoid military service. I don't really see this as a particularly common reason, but it is one of the potential reasons to fake symptoms. In my experience, I've seen a lot that are substance related, so people trying to gain substances. So for example, of course, I have a PhD in counseling. I'm not a physician, not a psychiatrist, but I've worked in places before with psychiatrists. And every now and then I would see presentations where people told me that they had disorders hoping that when I put that information in the progress notes, it would sway the psychiatrist. Another popular reason is circumstances related to the criminal justice system. So again, trying to avoid prison or trying to get better conditions. So maybe trying to get probation instead of prison, or again, being moved from one unit of the prison, which is undesirable, to a unit that is more desirable. So even though malingering is uncommon and usually just for a few different reasons, we still need to know how to detect it. The method to detect it and the accuracy and reliability of that method is really specific to the disorder being faked. Now, again, malingering is not common overall, but it's relatively more common with certain disorders. For example, I really haven't seen too much malingering with substance use disorders, meaning somebody doesn't have a substance use disorder and they're pretending to have one. I don't see it much with anxiety disorders, and I actually don't see too much malingering with personality disorders either. What we see more often in terms of malingering would be disorders like ADHD, major depressive disorder, and again, this has a potentially psychotic element to it. Major depressive disorder can have psychosis in certain situations. We see malingering with post-traumatic stress disorder, so somebody who doesn't have it pretending that they do. And I say the most popular disorder would be schizophrenia or something related to schizophrenia like schizoaffective disorder. And this, again, of course, has a psychotic element. So this kind of speaks to that third question I was talking about before, which is how does psychosis relate to malingering? Well, schizophrenia would be one of the major disorders that I see associated with malingering. When you hear the term malingering, oftentimes you first think of psychosis. A lot of times this is because of the potential gain an individual can have in the criminal justice system, as I mentioned before. So That criminal justice element is a popular motive. Therefore, schizophrenia is one of the disorders that's chosen oftentimes for malingering. So in terms of detecting malingering, again, it's specific to the disorder, but how can we detect it? So with many disorders, detecting someone who's malingering would be pretty difficult. For example, if somebody's faking OCD, that's fairly difficult to detect. ADHD, even though it's somewhat common, that's difficult to detect. Conduct disorder, adjustment disorder, and a number of other disorders would be really challenging to figure out in terms of detecting that malingering. But there are a few things to look for. None of these by themselves, of course, prove someone's malingering. These are just certain things that we see in the research literature that appear to be giveaways. They appear to be elements that we can detect and say, well, it raises the probability that we're dealing with malingering. So The first would be if someone has really unlikely symptom combinations. For example, somebody is trying to say they have major depressive disorder, but then they're repeatedly appearing happy or telling you that they're happy. Another would be when somebody's uncooperative. Now, again, that's just one element to look for. But if somebody's uncooperative in counseling, that could be a sign of malingering. If somebody says, I don't know a lot, if they respond that way a lot, even to relatively basic questions. If someone tries to intimidate you as a clinician, that's a sign if somebody's angry or they're upset by relatively benign questions. We wouldn't expect somebody to be upset by benign questions. It's a little unusual. If somebody hesitates when they're answering as if they're trying to think of the correct answer based on an answer they gave before, that's an indication. And one of the ones I've seen a few times is if somebody asks, how did I answer that question before? So you might have the chart in front of you 
or if it's electronic on the screen in front of you, and they'll say, oh, that's a good question, or, oh, yeah, I remember answering that before. What did I say before? That's a probably a little bit stronger indication of malingering. Another indication would be if they accuse you of inferring that they are faking. That's actually a fairly good indication as well. And also vague answers. If somebody answers always in kind of an impressionistic way, a way that lacks detail and can never give you specifics, that's an indication of an increased risk of malingering. Now, specifically looking at inconsistencies, we could divide inconsistencies up as internal and external. So for example, an internal inconsistency would be an inconsistency in the client's history as they report it. So for example, with post-traumatic stress disorder, if they report one clear cause in one interview, and then they say something else caused it in another, that's an internal inconsistency. Many of the inconsistencies related to malingering, however, are what are called external inconsistencies. And I think of these external inconsistencies as really being in two categories. The reported symptoms compared to the level of functioning and the reported symptoms compared to the observed symptoms. So an example with the level of functioning, if somebody's saying that they are depressed, and I mentioned this before with being depressed and being happy at the same time, and you can see them in the waiting room, like say that there's glass there as you walk out to the waiting room, and they're laughing hysterically in the waiting room. That's inconsistent with depression. Not impossible, of course, but it's one of those examples of reported symptoms being different than the observed level of functioning. In terms of observed symptoms, say somebody's trying to feign delusions and they say they're being chased by the government, yet they don't seem to react when you mention the CIA or the FBI. And let's say those particular agencies are part of their delusion. Usually if somebody's having a delusion about being chased by the government or persecuted by the government, they would have some reaction to that. Another example would be with obsessive compulsive disorder. If somebody says they have compulsions, but they don't have any intrusive thoughts, obsessions. It's unusual to have compulsions without obsessions. As a matter of fact, I don't know how that would even really be possible with OCD because obsessions are really required with that disorder. So again, it's not impossible. Like somebody could just report it incorrectly, but still that's an indication that something's going on potentially with malingering. Now, when talking about malingering and psychosis, I mentioned this before, this is an area we see a lot. Specifically with auditory hallucinations, there's a few things that are important to know as a clinician and really with a few other areas around psychosis. I'll talk about those too. So with auditory hallucinations, what we see is that they're usually clear, intermittent, and paired with delusions. Those are all very common. So if somebody says that they have auditory hallucinations, but they can't really make out what the voices are saying, that points to malingering. If they say that auditory hallucinations are happening all the time and they never get a break from them, that would be unusual. And also if they have auditory hallucinations or they report they have them and they don't have delusions, that would also stand out as potential malingering. Now, speaking of delusions, there are important elements to know about delusions as well. If you see that somebody reports delusions that have a sudden onset or termination, that's a little unusual. What we see with delusions is that they stay around a long time and they don't tend to end quickly or suddenly. If somebody's talking about paranoid delusions and they're being really straightforward with you, they're eager to talk to you about their paranoid delusions and they don't seem to have any fear around them, that's a bit unusual too. Now moving over to visual hallucinations. Visual hallucinations are actually pretty interesting in relation to malingering. We know with visual hallucinations, they're almost always in color. And it's rare that they would change based on somebody's eyes being open or closed. Another area would be that visual hallucinations usually involve normal sized people. So not involving people that would appear particularly small in the hallucinations. And I think what happens here is when individuals are trying to malinger visual hallucinations, they get confused with alcohol-induced symptoms. So there is a type of visual hallucination that involves seeing people that are small. They're called Lilliputian hallucinations, but they're actually fairly rare with schizophrenia, which is oftentimes, again, what somebody is trying to feign with the psychosis. 
We do see them, however, as I mentioned, with alcohol. So really, again, I think this is what happens here. People read about these Lilliputian hallucinations and they're related to alcohol, but they use them to try to feign schizophrenia. And this is a fairly good indication of malingering relative to the other indications. Again, no one sign proves somebody's malingering. Another thing I see with schizophrenia in general in terms of malingering is that the negative symptoms aren't usually faint. And like this would be the flat affect. These are fairly difficult symptoms to feign. And there's actually a few other areas of schizophrenia that are difficult to feign as well. Specific symptoms like word salad, loose associations, and derailment are also hard to fake. So usually when somebody's malingering and they're trying to show you they have schizophrenia or prove to you they have schizophrenia, they'll skip those particular symptoms, the negative symptoms, the word salad, the loose associations, and the derailment. So people can malinger. It is possible. Again, it's hard to detect, but it's hard to fake some of these symptoms and it's hard to fake some of them 24 hours a day. So there are some indications that clinicians can use, but accusing a client of malingering, no matter what the circumstances, is always a really sensitive situation. I would say seek supervision and really have everything well documented and have safety addressed before introducing any conversation about malingering. It's one of those things, again, malingering in general, that's uncommon. So we don't want to move into that area without being very careful. I would say that when you do seek supervision and it makes sense to introduce malingering after all these stages have been met and all the conditions have been met and you're fairly sure that's what you're dealing with, be ready for a negative reaction, a strong reaction, including potential violence. So it's important to have, again, safety considerations addressed before introducing this. Now, I said this a few times, but it's worth emphasizing, malingering is not something I would expect a clinician to see every day. So malingering and factitious disorder and somatic symptom disorder are fairly uncommon. So this is something to keep in mind, but not necessarily something to be focusing on a lot as a clinician. Our main job as counselors is to provide relief from symptoms to help clients meet their goals. Sometimes we'll see malingering and that's unfortunate. We have to know how to deal with that. But most of the time, clients are telling the truth. They're just trying to get better and they're coming to counseling so you can help them. So some important considerations when considering malingering. For more content like this, check out Healthy Toxic, another podcast from Ars Longa Media, all about what makes or breaks relationships, including issues related to narcissism, narcissistic abuse, and how personality disorders affect relationships. Ars Longa, Vita Brevis. Learn more at arslanga.media.